Thank you for inviting me to NIPS. You know, before I went into quantum computing, I actually started out my first year at Berkeley as a machine learning person. So I get to experience my, you know, an alternate life uh, trajectory here, a different branch of the wave function. So I'm looking forward to learning a lot. Uh, but, you know, it did uh, uh, present a dilemma in terms of what I should talk about because, you know, I could just give a standard technical talk about uh, quantum computing theory, but I wanted to somehow relate it more to NIPS. Uh, so, uh, yeah, quantum information and the brain. So my challenge is going to be to speak uh, for 45 minutes about an intersection of two fields that might be the empty set. Uh, however, uh, we don't know for certain that it is the empty set, and therefore I have something to talk about. Okay, so uh, often, you know, the case that, you know, quantum mechanics might have something to do with uh, cognition is parodied as the argument from two mysteries. You know, the mind is mysterious, quantum mechanics is also mysterious, ergo, they might be related somehow. Okay, so you might wonder, you know, what kind of scientifically irresponsible ignoramus, you know, would even toy with such a, you know, an, uh, an obviously sort of silly idea? So, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, so you, you know, you've, may, you've probably heard about Roger Penrose. He actually thinks something, you know, a hundred times more radical than this, that, you know, the brain is not merely a quantum computer. He thinks that it's a quantum gravitational computer, which could use sort of exotic new physics to solve Turing uncomputable problems. Okay, but moving on to sort of the relative conservatives in this list, right? So, I mean, Arthur Eddington, you know, uh, wrote a great deal about, you know, how maybe, you know, the uncertainty principle is relevant to sort of the free will and determinism discussion, you know, as did uh, Compton, uh, um, Eccles, uh, you know, several other of these people. Um, Alan Turing, maybe surprisingly, was hugely influenced by Eddington uh, throughout his life and actually wrote, you know, several times about how maybe the uncertainty principle, you know, presents some fundamental obstacle to scanning the state of a brain into a computer. Um, Okay, so, uh, you know, even if, you know, this sort of connection is uh, uh, ultimately rejected, it's clear that it's, you know, at least worth considering. Uh, you know, on the other hand, as soon as we start thinking about this, you know, we notice an obvious problem of scale. So here is uh, so, uh, three qubits in an ion trap quantum computer. Okay, and so the, it's less than one nanometer across, you know, and uh, this is a regime where quantum effects are predominant, okay, where, uh, you know, the, in fact, these uh, ions uh, don't even have, you know, definite locations, uh, so to speak. You know, there's just a wave function describing them, okay? You can sort of only, you know, approximately make a picture like this. Uh, so, um, you know, and then on the other hand, here is a neuron, uh, you know, and that may be something like 10,000 nanometers across, okay? And this is a regime where uh, decoherence predominates. So, you know, the uh, uh, neuron is in a bath. It's sort of in uh, contact with its external environment, and that's constantly sort of forcing down its quantum state into a, a classical state. And, uh, you know, this is decoherence is the basic reason why we don't experience Schrodinger cats in the realm of everyday life. Okay, now, there is an intermediate regime. I mean, if you look at a synaptic junction, that's, you know, maybe a few nanometers across. And, you know, in fact, there have been arguments that quantum effects are important for the, you know, modeling the uh, opening and closing of the sodium ion channels, like, the, you know, the, in the Hodgkin-Huxley equation. Okay, but, you know, even then, you know, there's also a huge problem of time. So the physicist Max Tegmark uh, did a calculation of, you know, what is the sort of longest possible time that a quantum s uh, superposition might be able to remain coherent in sort of the hot, wet environment of the brain, right? And under generous assumptions, you know, maybe it could last for about 10 to the minus 13 seconds. Okay, so you look at, you know, the n neuron firing rate, right, and it's just orders of magnitude different. Uh, you know, here we're looking at, you know, maybe 10 to the minus 3 seconds. Okay, uh, finally, last but not least, there's the problem of cringeworthy claims. So, I mean, if you, um, you know, th think that it's even worth sort of discussing, you know, whether there's a connection between, you know, the mysteries of quantum mechanics and of, and of thought, then you immediately find that your allies uh, are people who uh, think that quantum mechanics means that, you know, you can uh, create reality by, by wishing and that you can channel some 
thirty thousand year old uh, uh, cave woman named Ramtha or something. You know, this is from this movie uh, what, called "What the Bleep Do We Know?" Which, by the way, uh, quantum mechanics does not mean those things. Okay. So uh, uh, my view is that barring a scientific revolution, uh, you know, debates about quantum mechanics and mind, you know, will just continue popping up like, you know, whack-a-mole. Okay, and it's not even obvious that they shouldn't uh, because, you know, as I'll discuss, you know, I think that there genuinely is something profound that we don't understand about how quantum mechanics can give rise to the, you know, the definite world that we subjectively perceive. You know, many people have claimed to understand understand it over the last hundred years, but, you know, it's questionable uh, if, if any of them have. Okay, um, so my modest goal in this talk, it's a very modest talk, okay, uh, is going to be to explain, you know, various discoveries in the fields of quantum computing and information that might uh, bear on these debates. Now, along the way, I'll also discuss how a quantum computer could help or not help uh, with your, you know, applied machine learning tasks. Okay, uh, I could have focused the whole talk around that, but, you know, I feel that frankly, that that application of quantum computing is sort of already oversold as it is, so I didn't want to sort of fan the flames anymore. Okay, uh, but then I'll also discuss how in my own research, uh, concepts from machine learning have actually helped in quantum computing theory. Okay, so... Uh, so the first thing I've got to do is explain quantum mechanics in one slide. Uh, so, you know, I can actually do this because, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, the physicists somehow convinced everyone that quantum mechanics is complicated and hard. Okay, uh, the reality is that, you know, it is, quantum mechanics is unbelievably simple uh, once you take the physics out. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, the way that that I think about quantum mechanics, the way that most of us in quantum computing do, you know, at least most of the time, is that it is a certain generalization of the laws of probability. Okay, what do I mean? So, um, you know, in probability theory, well, what is it? Well, you're, you know, you represent your knowledge at any time, you know, as I don't have to tell uh, you folks, by a vector of non-negative real numbers, which sum to one and which are called probabilities. So this is your state. Okay, uh, if the state, you know, uh, if, this, if the system you're modeling undergoes evolution, then you update your knowledge of the system by taking that vector of probabilities and multiplying it by a matrix, uh, which has to uh, conserve, you know, the one norm or the sum of the probabilities. Such a matrix is, of course, called a stochastic matrix. Okay, now, uh, quantum mechanics is just the same thing, except that now, instead of a vector of non-negative real numbers, we're going to have a vector of complex numbers. And uh, instead of uh, conserving the one norm of the vector, we are going to conserve its two norm, okay, a norm which sort of God or nature seems to prefer over the one norm in every circumstance. Okay, fine. So... Um, uh, so now, you know, instead of stochastic matrices, we get to apply any linear transformation we want, you know, in principle, that uh, preserves the uh, two-norm of this vector. Okay, and such matrices have a name. They're called unitary matrices. Okay, so... Um, um, okay, now the source of all quantum weirdness, you know, as Richard Feynman sort of liked to emphasize, right, it all just boils down to one thing, uh, which is uh, uh, inter the, the fact that whereas probabilities are non-negative real numbers, amplitudes can be, you know, either positive or negative, and as such, the different amplitudes leading to some outcome can interfere destructively and cancel each other out. Okay, you can see that just by sim considering the simplest possible quantum system, a single quantum bit or qubit. Okay, so the possible states of a qubit just lie, you know, with real amplitudes only, let's say. Uh, the, the amplitudes are what these complex numbers are called. Okay, so, you know, since the sum of the squares of the amplitudes has to be one, they just form a circle. Okay, and now we have two perfectly distinguishable states, which we label by zero and one. So these are orthogonal vectors. Okay, and the physicists like to... Uh, uh, surround them by these little asymmetric brackets, which are called cats. You get used to them with time. Okay, so um, now to, you know, if you have a qubit that's initially in the state zero, you could modify it by applying a unitary transformation like this one here. Uh, this one corresponds to just a 45 degree counterclockwise rotation in the plane. So if you look at what it does, you know, if you applied it once, then you would get, as we say, an equal superposition of the zero and one states. 
okay, uh, if you apply that same transformation a second time, then you would rotate further, and then you would rotate all the way to definitely the one state. And you could just keep rotating all the way around. Okay, so already here we see something which is uh, not possible in the classical world, which is that this unitary transformation applies uh, what we could call the square root of not. Okay, it's, it's something that applied in twice in succession gives you the not gate. Okay, and once it's just, you know, the square root of a not gate. Okay, now a, a, a very nice way to understand what's going on is in terms of interference of amplitudes. Okay, so you can think of it this way. When we apply the unitary the first time, it maps zero to an equal superposition of zero and one. When we apply it a second time, well, you know, it acts linearly, and it maps zero to, again, to zero plus one, but it also maps one to minus zero plus one. Okay, and now, you know, there are two different possible paths sort of that you could have taken to go from zero up to zero plus one and then back down to zero, right? There's this path and there's this one. Okay, but one of those paths had a positive amplitude and the other had a negative amplitude. As a result, they interfere destructively and cancel each other out and you see one with certainty. Okay, so, you know, now at some point, of course, you've got to measure your quantum system and see what it's doing. So what happens if you take a qubit, say, which is in a superposition state, alpha zero plus beta one, and you apply a measurement that asks the qubit, are you zero or are you one? Okay, well, what happens is it gives you a probabilistic answer. So it tells you it's zero with probability absolute value of alpha squared and one with probability absolute value of beta squared. Okay, and, you know, of course, the, since our vector was, had unit norm, that gives us a, you know, a, a valid probability distribution. Okay, and crucially, whatever answer it gave, it sticks with it. Okay, it sticks with its story. If you ask it a second time, you know, if it tells you zero and you measure a second time, you're just going to get zero again rather than an independent sample. Okay, so measurement in quantum mechanics, as you may have heard, is a destructive process, right? You get one choice, you know, you get one chance to measure, sort of choose wisely how you want to measure because then, you know, you're going to sort of destroy the superposition. Okay, so, um, you know, the famous illustration of that is uh, the, the double slit experiment where you can take a photon, there's a photon, I'm, you know, I'm not an engineer, I'm a computer science, theoretical computer scientist, uh, and uh, you shoot it at a, a screen with two slits and you look at where will it end up on a second slit and, you know, it, it has a probability distribution over places where it could land, okay, and you find the distribution has this nice uh, wavy pattern, okay, which comes from interference between the amplitude for the uh, photon to be going through this way and the amplitude to it, for it to be going through, through this way. Okay, however, as soon as you start looking to see, well, you know, which slit is the damn thing going through, uh, then you find that it only goes through one slit or the other and the, the wavy interference pattern disappears and you just see uh, to a, to a mixture of two Gaussians. Okay, now I hasten to add that to, in order to destroy the interference pattern, it's not important that you look. Okay, it could, you could just as well destroy the interference pattern if there were some mechanical recording device that were, you know, or in general, any uh, object whatsoever that records the information about which path the photon goes through. Okay, that will destroy the interference pattern just the same. Okay, however, you know, it, that then pushes the question back. And you could then ask, okay, what about the recording device itself? Uh, is that then going to be in a superposition of registering that the photon went through the first slit and registering that it went through the second slit until you look at the recording device, right? Where does the buck stop? Okay, fine. So, um, you know, another way to say, you know, to, to look at this is to just consider um, um, the treatment of multiple qubits. Okay, so if you have just two qubits side by side, you can simply, you know, model it by forming what's called their tensor product. Okay, so the amplitudes multiply. So if you have this state here, you just get alpha times gamma amplitude for zero, zero, and alpha times delta amplitude for zero, one, and so forth. Okay, however, you know, there are some states of two qubits that cannot be decomposed in that way as products, that, as products of two in individual uh, qubits. Those are called entangled. Okay, famous example being the einstein podolsky rosen pair, which is this state zero, zero plus one, one over square root of two. Okay, so this is, you know, the quantum analog of correlation. Okay, it's called entanglement. 
Okay, now, the deep mystery of quantum mechanics, uh, you know, uh, uh, so to speak, is, well, you know, who decides when measurement happens, right? I mean, presumably, you know, you also are, are made of atoms, you know, your measuring device is made of atoms, and, you know, and they all, those atoms ought to be obeying exactly the same rules of unitary evolution as any other atoms, including the ones that you're measuring, right? So, you know, how or when does, you know, does the universe ever decide to stop this process of unitary Unitary evolution and say, okay, now we're going to have a definite outcome. Okay, well, you know, what you can do is you can say, suppose that you were measuring a qubit, then what would that look like to an outsider that w who was modeling you as a quantum system? Okay, and what it would look like is pretty well understood these days. What it would look like is that initially you've got the qubit and then you've got the rest of the world. Okay, and the rest of the world is, uh, you know, initially unentangled with the qubit. However, then some, you know, measurement takes place which affects a unitary transformation which has the effect of entangling that qubit with the de degrees of freedom in the rest of the world, including, you know, the atoms, you know, of your brain, okay, but also including, you know, the ambient air in the room and, you know, all sorts of other stuff. And so then, you know, quantum mechanics would predict that you should get a superposition like this. Alpha zero and the rest of the world, including you having registered the zero outcome, plus beta one and the rest of the world, including you having registered the one outcome. Okay, so this qubit simply gets entangled with you. Okay, so uh, taking this seriously, or you know, pushing it further, you know, leads to what's called the many worlds interpretation, uh, you know, which says that uh, actually, you know, uh, quantum states never really collapse. You know, you perceive, you know, either a zero or a one, but you know, the laws of unitary evolution straightforwardly predict that whatever outcome you saw, you know, the other outcome, you know, has not disappeared. It's still there in the quantum state. Okay, in some sense. Okay, and so then you get the idea that you know you have all these you know these different branches you know one in which I became a machine learning person or whatever. Okay, so um, you know now my own view is that you know you basically just have three possible options. You can accept the many worlds view. You know you don't have to call it that, right? You can you know you could have Bohmian hidden variables. You could you know uh, use fancier language, but the many worlds are still going to be there in some sense. Or you could say, look, there has to be some kind of radical new physics that says that once a you know, a state, a, a superposition gets up to some scale of complexity or mass or something, then something new comes in and forces it down to a classical outcome. Okay, or you can just say, well, shut up and stop asking the question. Okay, I'd say that number three is, you know, remains by far the most popular position among physicists. Um, you know, my own view, uh, 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 standpoint is that sort of I agree with every interpretation of quantum mechanics uh, insofar as it criticizes the other interpretations. Interpretations. Okay, so, but now, uh, starting in the, the 1970s, uh, physicist David Deutsch uh, started saying, look, you know, I think that the many worlds are literally there. They're just straightforwardly real, and not only that, there's an experiment that could demonstrate it. Okay, so what was Deutsch's exper uh, experiment? Well, it's very simple. Step one is to build an artificially intelligent quantum computer. <laughs> okay? Uh, so you got a computer, you know, and it furthermore can, you know, can be manipulated in quantum superposition states. All right, fine. After you've done that, step two is to put this computer into a superposition of thinking one thought and thinking another one. You put it in a superposition of two mental states. And then step three is that you perform a quantum mechanical measurement which would detect the interference. Uh, between these two states, you know, thereby proving that they were both there in superposition, and then, you know, I mean, modulo your belief that this computer was actually conscious, you would then have proved that, yes, a conscious entity can be in a quantum superposition of two different, you know, uh, mental states. Okay, incidentally, the reason why he needed to talk about a computer here is that with a, a human, it's possible that this experiment could never be done, simply because the coupling, you know, is so enormous between, you know, a human brain and, you know, the air in the room, the ambient radiation and all sorts of stuff, right? It's just not practical to, lo to, uh, um, to isolate a brain from its external environment. Okay, but a computer that you get to engineer and, you know, cool it to close to absolute zero and, you know, isolate it from, from you know, from everything else, you know, may maybe in principle this could be done. Okay, so as zany as this sounds, right, this thought experiment of Deutsch was one of the ideas, I think, that led to what today is the field of quantum computation. 
Okay, so what is the idea of quantum computing? Well, first of all, that's this is a, when I did a Google image search for quantum computer. This was like one of the first things that came up. That might be what they look like. Uh, again, I'm I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a theorist. Okay, so. The basic idea is that a general entangled state of n qubits, you know, actually requires something like two to the n amplitudes to specify. Okay, because you've got to give another amplitude for every possible configuration of all n of the bits. Okay, that is a staggering fact. It says that just to keep track of the states of, say, a thousand particles that nature off to the side somewhere has to, you know, keep like uh, uh, a slip of paper with two to the thousand slip uh, 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 complex numbers, you know, and constantly update them. Okay, and this presents an obvious you know, practical problem known for many decades uh, to people who try to use conventional computers to simulate quantum mechanics. Okay, you know, that you get an exponential slowdown with the number of particles. Okay, but, um, you know, so then finally, you know, in the 80s, you know, people like uh, uh, Deutsch and like Richard Feynman, you know, finally started saying, well then, you know, why not just turn things around and build computers that themselves could exploit uh, principles of quantum superposition? Okay, well, what would such a computer be good for? Well, you know, at least one thing. It would be good for simulating quantum physics. Um, you know, now as tautological as that sounds, I think think that if we ever get practical quantum computers, actually simulating quantum physics will probably be the main thing that they're used for, okay? Because it's a huge application area for uh, drug design, for uh, um, uh, material science, for understanding high temperature superconductivity, uh, for lots and lots of other things, okay? And it's something that a quantum computer does in its sleep, okay? But of course, what really got everyone excited about this field was uh, Peter Shor's discovery in 1994 that a quantum computer could do uh, more than just simulating quantum physics, okay? And he showed that, um, in particular, it could uh, factor integers and, you know, take, calculate discrete logarithms in polynomial time and thereby, as it happens, break almost all of the public key cryptography which is currently used on the Internet. Okay, so various people got interested in quantum computing who, who hadn't been interested uh, before. Okay, um, uh, so where are we now? Well, after, you know, uh, um, you know, like 18 years, about a billion dollars of funding in this field, you know, a quantum computer just recently uh, was reported to a factor 21 into 3 times 7 uh, with high statistical confidence. Uh, so, look, you know, uh, uh, you know, these are great physics experiments. In fact, you know, the Nobel Prize in physics was just given, you know, a month ago for these sorts of experiments. You know, scaling it up is really, really hard, uh, be again, because of decoherence because of the need to isolate the machine from its environment. However, unless quantum mechanics is wrong, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be any fundamental obstacle. On the contrary, we now know that if you can get the decoherence rate to some small but non-zero level, then there are these extremely clever quantum error correcting codes that can render the remaining effects of the decoherence insignificant. Okay? We're just so, you know, in the case of uh, uh, classical uh, computing, you know, it took more than a century from charging Charles Babbage to the invention of the transistor that finally made the idea practical, right? In the case of quantum computing, who knows how long it's going to take, okay? But, you know, looks like it's possible in principle, right? If there's something wrong with quantum mechanics or, you know, with the physics, of course, that's even more exciting. Then we'd be even happier, okay? That's definitely more Nobel Prizes, okay? <laughs> So, um, okay, but now one thing that I think is not appreciated nearly as much as it should be is that even if we had ideal quantum computers, they would still have significant limitations. So contrary to almost every popular article which has ever been written on this subject, a quantum computer would not let you try all answers in parallel and instantly pick the best one. That's not how it works. Sounds too good to be true, and it is. Okay, uh, here's the problem with that. Yes, you can make a superposition over all the possible answers, but then you have to measure at some point, right? And when you measure, you're just going to get a random answer where X, you know, will appear with like probability equal to the absolute square of the amplitude of X. Okay, and of course, if you just wanted a random answer, then you could have generated one yourself with much less trouble, okay? So, you know, if you want, if you have any 
for any hope of getting a speed up, you need to exploit interference in order to get the different paths leading to a given wrong answer to sort of cancel each other out. So some have positive amplitudes, others have negative amplitudes, whereas the different paths that lead to the right answer should all reinforce each other. Okay, you know, that's, the, that's really the trick in any quantum computation. Okay, it's not obvious that it can be done, you know, ever. Okay, it was an amazing discovery that it can be done for a few problems, for a few special problems like factoring integers, you know, various other things in algebra, number theory, group theory, you know, uh, relevant to cryptography, uh, you know, to, to some other areas. Okay, but a crucial point is that the prevailing belief today is that NP is not contained in BQP. Where here BQP means bounded error quantum polynomial time. That's the class of all the problems that are solved solvable efficiently by a quantum computer. Okay, so in other words, uh, we believe today that there's no polynomial time quantum algorithm to solve the NP-complete problems okay, in, in general. You know, and of course we can't prove that. You know, we can't even prove that classical computers can't solve these problems, right? That's the P versus NP problem. Okay, but it's the prevailing belief. Okay, so on what evidence, you know, you might ask. Uh, so all right, an, an important result due to Bennett et al. said that if you have just a completely unstructured search problem, you know, involving n possible solutions, then, you know, even a quantum computer, which is able to query all of the possible solutions in superposition, okay, is going to need at least on the order of square root of n steps in order to find the, you know, a desired solution uh, with high probability. Okay, now that square root of n uh, bound actually turns out to be achievable using what's called Grover's algorithm, which is probably the second most famous quantum algorithm after Shor's. Okay, now, so Grover's algorithm is, you know, has, is extremely widely applicable. Okay, it lets you take any combinatorial search problem whatsoever, basically, and reduce the number of time, is reduce the number of steps needed to solve it by a square root factor from, for example, 2 to the n to 2 to the n over 2. Okay, but of course, that's not, that doesn't change an exponential into a polynomial, right? That's a, a quadratic speed up. Okay, so now you might ask, okay, but could a quantum computer solve NP-hard optimization problems, for example, problems arising in machine learning uh, in polynomial time by exploiting the problem structure in the same way that a classical algorithm uh, would exploit their structure? Okay, well, if there's a famous attempt to do so, which is called the quantum adiabatic algorithm, which was proposed by my uh, colleagues in MIT physics, including Ed Farhi, um, over a decade ago. And uh, you can think of this algorithm as being basically the quantum analog of simulated annealing. Okay, so it's like it's a heuristic algorithm, and it basically does sort of simulated annealing, but sort of enhanced by quantum tunneling effects. Okay, so if for those who know what this means, you start in some Hamiltonian, which is like an instantaneous time unitary transformation that has some known easily prepared ground state. Then you slowly transition it to a Hamiltonian whose ground state encodes the solution to your NP-complete problem. And there's a theorem that says that as long as you vary the Hamiltonian slowly enough, the uh, ground st the, the state of your quantum computer must just get tracked, you know, along with the ground state. And so then at the end, you'll be able to measure and get the solution to your NP-complete problem. Okay, the key, the million-dollar question here is how slowly is slowly enough? All right, and here the problem is that, you know, the running, the time you need to run this algorithm for is determined by what's called the inverse eigenvalue gap of the Hamiltonian. Okay, and what you find when you try running this on, you know, hard, like, three sat instances, for example, and people have tried it both numerically and sort of analytically uh, for, you know, the, the last decade. Okay, you find that often the, uh, this eigenvalue gap, just at one little point, it becomes exponentially small. So it looks like the two eigenvalues are crossing each other, you know, they're not quite, okay? But, you know, beca you know, because of that one little place where these eigenvalues almost kiss, that's why you have to run the algorithm for exponential time. <laughs> okay, so far he told me the story that he once asked an expert in condensed matter physics, look, based on your experience, you know, over decades with all sorts of similar physical systems, do you think that this eigenvalue gap is going to decrease polynomially or exponentially as the size of the system increases? And this expert said, well, I think it will decrease exponentially. And and, the, and for he said, well, why? What makes you say that? And the expert said, well, because otherwise your algorithm would work. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, if you believe strongly enough that NP-complete <laughs> problems are hard, you can reason backwards from that. But all right. Um, 
So what we know today is that on some fitness landscapes, the adiabatic algorithm can reach a global minimum exponentially faster than classical simulated annealing. But on other types of fitness landscapes, it does about the same or even worse. To know what sort of behavior predominates in practice, well, it would help a lot to have a quantum computer to test it out with. Uh, now some of you might be saying, but isn't there this company that's, you know, already, you know, claims to have already built quantum computers that can, you know, run the uh, quantum adiabatic algorithm? Well, indeed there is. You know, it's called D-Wave Systems, you know, and they, they have these devices, right? And, you know, here's the situation. Uh, we know that their devices sort of can solve optimization problems on up to about 100 bits, you know, and in fact solve them reasonably well, you know, fairly quickly. We also know that at least at the one qubit level, there is some kind of quantum co coherence in D-Wave's devices. What we don't know at this point is whether the quantum coherence is playing any kind of causal role in speeding up the computation. In other words, it remains consistent with what we know today that what D-Wave has done is basically to build like a very fast, special purpose, classical computer for simulated annealing. Okay, now there's a group at USC which is currently running tests with this machine, and hopefully we'll know a lot more uh, in the near future about, you know, about uh, 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 its characterization. Okay, but for now, I'd say it remains, you know, so to speak, a black box. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, all right, as an aside, um, you know, you may wonder, can, um, uh, you know, is, is it actually true that, you know, as, as all the popular articles say, that n qubits can encode two to the n power classical bits? Well, you know, that's the number of bits that you would need to describe the state of n qubits, but, you know, the number of bits that you can actually read out by measuring the qubits may be much, much smaller than that. Okay, and in fact, you know, I was able to use some machine learning type of ideas to show that in certain, you know, um, um, operational senses, a quantum state of n qubits behaves effectively like it has only a polynomial number of bits rather than an exponential number. Okay, so here's uh, one theorem that I... That, that I proved, uh, so it says, given any n qubit state psi, suppose that you only care about psi's behavior on two outcome measurements in some finite set S. Okay, then there exists a subset of those measurements, call it T, of a very small size, only n log n measurements, such that basically if you did a training process where you sort of started with the maximally ignorant guess about what psi was, and then you post-selected on your state giving you the right answers on all the measurements in the set T, you know, on all n log n of them, then you would end up with a state that approximately simulates the behavior of psi, your desired state, on all the measurements in, in, uh, in, the, in the entire set S. Okay, so what does, you know, and the idea of the proof is to use a Darwinian sort of training process similar to boosting. So you repeatedly find a measurement where your current guess is still badly wrong, even conditioned on being right on all the previous guesses. Okay, and then, you know, if you condition on being right on that new example, then sort of you, mu you, know, you must learn something, right? And if there's no, you know, example where you're badly wrong, then you're done. Right? And, you know, and then you prove a bound by using the linearity of quantum mechanics on the number of you know, training steps you would have to go through before you, know, you must have a state that, you know, that, that, that works for everything. Okay, um, you know, well, what, what this means is that we can describe the behavior of an n qubit state psi, you know, on well enough to sort of reproduce, you know, the, the probability that you're going to get a yes, you know, under two to the n different measurements, and we can do that, you know, using just a summary with only n squared log n classical bits. It's a polynomial number of classical bits. Okay, so when we ask this sort of question, you know, quantum states sort of, you know, seem to shrink down to size in some way. Um, you know, now, uh, later I proved another theorem, which, you know, is even more directly sort of a, a machine learning flavor. It says, given an n qubit state psi, suppose you only care about its behavior on two outcome measurements that are drawn from some probability distribution D. Okay, then what you could do is draw some sample measurements, m1 up to mk, you know, independently from D, and the number of such measurements only has to be linear, not exponential, with the number of qubits. Okay, so L of n sample measurements. Then find any hypothesis state, phi, that approximately agrees with psi, your target state, on all of those sample measurements. Okay, and then one can prove that with high probability over the choice of sample measurements, that phi must also approximately simulate the behavior of psi on most measurements drawn from the entire distribution. 
Okay, and the proof idea is to use the notion of fat shattering dimension from learning theory. You show, you consider like the class of all quantum states as a hypothesis class. You use quantum information ideas again based on quantum mechanical linearity to show to upper bound the fat shattering dimension of quantum states. You know, and this uh, could have some actual applications in uh, quantum state tomography because this gives you, in other words, characterizing an unknown quantum state given a lot of independent copies of it. Okay, because this it says if you only care about predicting the outcomes of most measurements, then you can reduce the amount of sample data that you need from exponential to linear. Okay, uh, so um, you know this was just you know a, a theorem, but uh, um, a few uh, years ago I worked with a student, uh, Eyal Dechter, who's here, and uh, uh, he actually uh, implemented this quantum state you know learning process in MATLAB, and we tried it out on various simulated examples, and you know the result of these uh, numerical experiments is that uh, my theorem appears to be true. So uh, the uh, you know indeed the sample complexity only uh, grows linearly with the uh, the no with the the uh, number of qubits, and in fact, you know, and the constants are perfectly reasonable as well. Okay, the one last thing I want to mention is uh, the no cloning theorem. This is the principle that says that there is no physical procedure to copy an unknown quantum state. Okay, and the reason for that is simply that if you write out algebraically what cloning of a quantum state would mean, you know, you find that it acts quadratically in the amplitudes. Okay, but that's not allowed. Unitary transformations have to be linear. Okay, and um, so, you know, this makes quantum information hugely different from classical information. You know, you've heard that information wants to be free, right, but quantum information wants to be private in some sense, okay? Uh, you know, it's closely related to the uncertainty principle, which says, you know, you can't simultaneously measure both the position and the momentum of a particle to unlimited precision. You know, the two imply each other, actually. Uh, you know, now there have been some amazing applications of the no cloning theorem uh, to quantum information. Uh, you know, one is quantum key distribution. So Alice and Bob can do cryptography by sending photons, you know, sending qubits down a fiber optic cable. And if an eavesdropper, say Eve, you know, tries to measure uh, the qubits, then Alice and Bob will actually be able to detect that their qubits have, have been tampered with and therefore abort the protocol. This is already practical. Okay? You can buy devices now that will implement quantum key distribution. I don't know how much market there is, but, you know. Um, so, so, you know, a more speculative thing is quantum money, where you would have uh, some qubits attached to each uh, dollar bill, let's say, uh, you know, s such that, you know, a, uh, um, the, the bank that printed the uh, bills could authenticate a state as genuine by measuring the qubits. Okay, but someone who didn't know how the qubits were prepared would be physically unable to copy a bill. Okay, because, you know, again, because of the no cloning theorem. Okay, recently with Paul Christiana, we showed that under some cryptographic assumptions, you can even get quantum money that can be verified by anyone, not only the bank. Okay, and then one, another thing that Cristiano and I are now working on is quantum copy-protected software, quantum DRM. So you would get some state psi, sorry, sorry, some state psi sub f that, you know, but, you know, it's not, don't worry, it's not going to be practical for a long time. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's a state size of f lets you evaluate some function f on inputs x of your choice, but that you would not be able to efficiently use to learn the function f or indeed to prepare any more states with which f could be evaluated. And we actually think that this can be done in general now. Okay. So, all right, but now let me ask in my remaining few minutes, is quantum mechanics relevant to biology? Okay, well, at a small enough scale, you know, we now know the answer is certainly yes, right? That shouldn't be such a surprise because, you know, at a small enough scale, everything is quantum mechanical. Okay, but there have been some really, you know, cool recent papers saying that, for example, uh, green plant photosynthesis, right? The reason why it's able to be as efficient as it is at harvesting photons, you know, fundamentally has to do with a coherent quantum optical effect. Okay, and people are now working on reverse engineering that so that, you know, maybe they could eventually design solar cells that would have similar efficiencies. Okay, uh, uh, European robins and, and various other birds have this amazing, you know, ability to navigate by internal compasses, okay? And it's, you know, over the last decade, it's been discovered that, you know, the way their, their internal compasses work is by measuring the um, uh, magnetic field gradient between two entangled electrons, okay? So, you know, this robin uses quantum information, so, you know, why not us, right? Okay, well, you know, now let's ask, you know, so is, could quantum 
biomechanics be relevant to the brain? So, you know, there are three proposals that I've seen for how it could conceivably be relevant. It's important to keep them uh, separate. Okay, the first proposal would be that the brain is literally a quantum computer, that it can run the quantum adiabatic algorithm or Shor's algorithm or, or whatever. Okay, the second would be, you know, this old idea that the collapse of the wave function somehow has to do with consciousness. And the third proposal would be that there are quantum mechanical limits on the physical predictability of the brain. Okay, so to cut to the chase, I am going to argue that uh, based on our current understanding, uh, the first two of these possibilities uh, can be pretty strongly rejected. Uh, the third, I have no idea. And in fact, I think it's a one, you know, it opens up wonderful uh, possible avenues for research. Okay, so could the brain be a quantum computer? Well, we've already discussed that idea's physical implausibility. Okay, but now you know, I want to make a different point, which is that you know, even you know, if you forgot about the physics, there are other severe problems with this idea that I think are just as important. The first is that we now know a lot, as I told you, about the sorts of things that a quantum computer would be good for. Okay, factoring integers, uh, discrete logarithms, uh, um, simulating quantum field theory, you know, uh, maybe some kind of small speed ups for combina modest speed ups for combinatorial optimization problems. Okay, well, you know, at least you know, with the possible exception of the of the last, none of these are things that you know had obvious survival value in the African savanna. Uh, it's not clear why we would have evolved these these abilities, right? Uh, you know, maybe more to the point, you know, I don't see any evidence that humans do solve problems like factoring integers or simulating quantum physics efficiently. Okay, I mean. Yes, humans do seem amazingly good at certain types of problems, but you know, but the things that we're good at are just not at all a good fit for you know to the things that we've discovered that a quantum computer you know would would be good at or would give us a speed up for. Okay. Uh, thirdly, you know, even supposing that the brain were a quantum computer, sort of, I wonder how that would help at all with sort of the mystery of consciousness that presumably motivated the suggestion, right? I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know, like the, if we talk about like this millennia-old mind-body problem, right? It's not clear to me how you are going to bridge the gap between mind and body with a hardware upgrade, okay, uh, which is really what we're talking about here, right? And, you know, this is like, you know, a very common objection that's been made, for example, to Roger Penrose's ideas, right? Even supposing it's right, you know, it still doesn't seem to explain consciousness. Okay, so could, conscious, you know, could uh, uh, consciousness be needed for the collapse of the wave function? Well, if you wanted to believe that, then here is what you would have to believe. Okay, you'd have to believe that, you know, the Big Bang, the universe has some quantum state. Okay, then for 13.7 billion years, it evolves via unitary evolution, you know, um, no measurement anywhere in sight. And then, you know, the Earth cools, you know, and then finally, you know, a human evolves, or maybe it's a monkey or something, right? And they, and they look around, and then that just suddenly and violently collapses the universe's quantum state. Okay, well, this is, uh, uh, not, uh, I think, an absurdity. So, you know, my conclusion is that if collapse is a physical phenomenon at all, if you want to believe it is, then you have to also believe that it's something that can happen all over the place, in the interiors of stars or whatever, triggered by some physical conditions that we don't know yet, okay, even with no conscious observers for light years around. You know, otherwise, I think we get nonsense. Okay, but now what about quantum limits on predictability? This will be my last thing. All right, well, let's consider faxing yourself to another planet, like in Star Trek, okay? So, you know, you go into the brain scanner, scans your brain, you know, that's Lake Tahoe, that's Mars, uh, you know, you, you end up over there, okay? Uh, you know, it sounds great, you know, why, why can't we have it? Okay, well, um, you know, if you're going to do this, you know, one thing that's important, remember to, you know, have the original copy of yourself painlessly euthanized, okay? Or else, you know, if you leave it alive, right, who knows which one you're going to wake up as, <laughs> right? Maybe you'll wake up as the original copy, okay? Or, you know, maybe you want to keep a backup copy of yourself, right? But, you know, with 10 backups of you running around, right, how, you know, how do you know which one you are? How do you even make, you know, Bayesian predictions in, in, in such a world? Okay, so, you know, you start thinking about these puzzles, which philosophers love to talk about, you know, there's a whole huge literature on these things, and you start scratching your head over all these, these you know, bizarre puzzles, and you start thinking, you know, uh, wouldn't it be great if there were some sort of principle of non-clonability that prevented this sort of metaphysical craziness from ever rearing its head? 
You say, wait a minute. You know, and then you say, well, such a principle might also prevent Deutsch's many worlds experiment from, you know, being performed with a human subject, right? If you can't sort of read out the classical state of something, then, you know, you may also not be able to put it in a coherent superposition of two states. Okay, so the question is the following. Does the no cloning theorem actually put interesting limits on our ability to, put, to copy the cognitively relevant information in a brain? And I think that there's like a spectrum of scientific opinion on this question, which ranges from, you know, obviously not. Look, you know, we already have fMRI scanners. You know, it should just take the engineers, you know, another 50 years, maybe 100, in order to invent nanorobots that could swarm through your brain and, you know, and scan the, uh, the the strength of every synapse, you know, and, and just and, and, and then download everything to a computer. So, you know, you could then make copies of yourself. Okay, this is at least this is what my friends in the singularity movement tell me. Okay. Uh, the other side of the spectrum is people who say, well, cloning a brain is obviously impossible, even just for classical reasons, ignoring quantum mechanics. I heard someone say that, you know, using the no cloning theorem to, you know, um, to argue for the unclonability of the brain is like, you know, hiring the world's most high powered lawyer to get you out of a parking ticket. Okay. But, um, you know, so a crucial question here is, well, what exactly counts as the cognitively relevant information? You know, does it include only the sort of macro information about the neurons or, you know, does it include like the quantum states of the individual sodium ion channels and so forth? I mean, that's partly a philosophical question, but I think partly also an empirical one because, you know, like you might never know that you had copied all the, you know, the, the, the needed information, but you might know for sure that you hadn't copied it. If your model was totally, you know, badly miscalibrated and didn't predict the original person well at all. Okay, so, um, Here's a quote by, from Niels Bohr. Uh, he says, we should doubtless kill an animal if we tried to carry the investigation of its organs so far that we could tell the part played by the single atoms in vital functions. The idea suggests itself that the minimal freedom we must allow the organism will be just large enough to permit it, so to say, to hide its ultimate secrets from us. So my proposal is simply that neuroscientists and machine learning folks should treat Bohr's claim as fighting words. They should see how far it can be falsified. Okay, as to some extent, of course, in crude ways, people already have. So, you know, you can look at these experiments like Libet's that look at this, you know, look for this readiness potential that says, you know, you're about to flick your finger, you know, up to maybe a second before you do it. And today, I think using fMRI, they can predict it with about 60 or 70 percent probability. On the other hand, you may be able to predict that just using machine learning with no brain scan needed, right? So that's, you know, a pretty weak kind of prediction, right? And, you know, how strong can you get the prediction? Right, how well can you trace a decision to, you know, this firing of this neuron, this opening of this sodium ion channel, and so forth? I think those are great questions. So, in conclusion, you know, several speculations that one hears, for example, that the brain is a quantum computer or that its activity is needed for wave function collapse, I think are profoundly implausible, and not only on physical and biological grounds, but on logical and computational grounds as well. Okay, by contrast, the question of the fundamental physical limits of biological prediction, like is the no-cloning theorem ever relevant, seems fascinating to me and underexplored. And unlike with a lot of these sort of big questions, you know, here I think that there's a serious prospect that progress in neuroscience and physics and machine learning could actually tell us more. So thank you. Derandomization. Yep. And a standard argument against derandomization is that random numbers are physically... Um, easily available, that we can mm -hmm. amplify quantum noise and, yep. and make physically random number generators. Is the last question, you know, can we predict the brain, mm -hmm. um, simply a question of are we using physically random number generators and random algorithms, and if, yeah. is that an interesting, really, question? Yeah, so, so, so a lot of people ask this question, right, and a lot of people have made the point, which I think is completely valid, right, that if you had, like, a way that you could predict the probabilities, you know, by, of, you know that a, a person would take any action, you know, in the same sense that sort of you know, you could predict the probabilities for a radioactive atom, right? Then this is not, you know, free will in the sense that most people would, you know, would mean by that or in some metaphor.
physical sense, right? So, so I think that, you know, if you can actually get sort of well-calibrated and sort of informative probabilistic predictions, and if you can trace, for, if you can furthermore trace the source of the probabilistic noise to, you know, okay, it's coming from, you know, this, you know, uh, uh, you know, stochastic element or, you know, this quantum mechanical element, right? That, you know, we, like in quantum mechanics, we have excellent arguments why it must be real randomness. It can't be pseudo-randomness or else you would need faster than light communication, right? That's what the Bell inequality basically tells you, okay? So, you know, so there we know that, okay, there's a reason why we're never going to get further than making these probabilistic predictions. Okay, at that point, I would say that you have understood everything about this system that it's possible to understand, right? I would be completely happy to agree about that. So my question is simply, can you get to that point? You know, even getting well-calibrated probabilistic predictions, right? Or are you, you know, always going to stay in a situation of, like, of nighty and uncertainty, I guess, as the economists call it, or even your, predict your probabilities are not well-calibrated? Any other questions? Uh, my concern is about trying to build an artificial machine which is conscious mm -hmm. and intelligent. Uh, if you are going to make this machine work using pseudo-random numbers, these numbers are not really random. Yeah. So do you think you would need some kind of uh, quantum random number generator mm -hmm. for the machine? And in that way, I mean uh, plugging the random number generator to the real world, for example, mm -hmm. taking the uh, seats, uh, the seat numbers from, say, I don't know, like the uh, static on your TV screen, mm -hmm. for example, or mm -hmm. some yeah. antenna or whatever. Yeah. So, okay, so, so, so I have no idea, first of all, right? But I think that there was a Futurama episode based on this where, you know, Bender only acquires free will by plugging a quantum random number generator into his, uh, into his forehead, right? But uh, uh, so, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the issue is uh, that uh, we... Um, uh, you know, if, if you had, you know, like a, you know, something that, that sort of was deterministic except for a random number generator that it's sometimes called, for example, you know, then regardless of whether that was a truly random or pseudo-random, right, then, you know, you could, you know, an external agent could sort of form a perfectly accurate sort of model of, you know, everything that that agent is going to do, right? And so, so you, you would be in the situation where you would have, uh, you know, an, like a, a an entity, right, that may be able to pass the Turing test and so forth, but only if you don't know its code, right? And, you know, and, and someone could easily scan it and, you know, get its code, and then, you know, to that person, you know, it wouldn't look, it would no longer look like a sort of uh, like a mind at all. It would, you know, look like a mechanism, right, to someone who, to someone who knew the code. Okay, and so the question, the sort of empirical question here, if you like, is sort of can the code, you know, for us be read out? So here's a possible challenge for machine learning yes. coming from quantum mechanics. Tell yes. me if it makes any sense. Sure. Uh, say uh, decoherence is just a property of a sufficiently large number of correlated variables. Yep. Right? If you get enough of them, then it decoheres. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the problem is that we don't actually have the math or the capability right now to understand or predict or prove that that happens. But that's maybe where something like machine learning and probabilistic reasoning mm -hmm. might, might help. Huh. Well, okay. well I, mean, I think I mentioned in the talk there are lots of applica possible applications for machine learning ideas to you know all sorts of issues in quantum information, right? So I think that you know at the rough mathematical level, decoherence is fairly well understood, right? There's been a whole theory of it that's been developed over the last 40 years. You know now whether machine learning ideas could contribute. I mean, you know, one place where they certainly have contributed is like you know, understanding you know how do you do tomography of a quantum state, right? How do you characterize what the quantum state of your system system is. How do you prove that there was really entanglement there so that you can publish your paper in Nature or whatever, right? You know, these are issues where I think machine learning has already played a role and where it could play an even bigger role in the future. Okay, let's thank this figure again.